Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com wraps up what happened on the major markets. The NASDAQ set a new record and gold had a good week. InsideTrackTrading.com president Eric Haddock takes a look at the cycles surrounding the markets with comments on gold, silver, crude, and Bitcoin. Co-founder of the Polar Futures Group, Victor Adair, gives us his thoughts after trading on the markets for the last 50 years. He has some advice for those people who have just started trading. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can also find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. And it's good to be with you, Jim. Sort of an augmented week here with uh, Canada closed on Wednesday and the U.S. closed on Friday. But, uh, you know, it, uh, they managed to finish off a pretty darn calendar quarter. And another record week for the NASDAQ. Yes, this thing just keeps on going. You know, at this pace, it'll start to look like 1999. Well, are we partying like it's 1999? <laughs> Well, if you're in the fangs, and we're going to include stocks also like Shopify or uh, Square in that fang group, uh, if you're in the Infotech area, it is very much like 99. I mean, you know, there's Shopify. For over 40% of the movement on the upside this year on the TSX can be attributed to that stock. I mean, the, the market cap on this thing is just out of hand right now. But... Uh, you know, when these things start running, then it's, it's all, it, it just becomes a momentum game. And, uh, you can't even think about doing valuations. You've got to watch them, see how they run. Put out a piece a week or so ago, uh, looking at the current, you know, sort of the, the new nifty fifties versus what happened in the, in the seventies and in the late nineties. And once these things start going, um, it's, so you have to wait till they, they either have a climactic high, and that would have to be on, you know, uh, overbought daily, weekly, and monthly readings, not just any one of them, and then show uh, the first sign of weakness with some downside volume, taking out some supports. But uh, you, you just don't want to be in front of the freight train right here. So uh, the... But, you know, as far as the rest of the market is concerned, you know, you look at the Dow or the S&P, they've been good recoveries off the March low. Uh, but the last 10 days or so, we've been into a consolidation phase. And the, uh, as I see it, these markets can still be in what you would call a topping phase with the uh, uh, this bounce level that we're at right now and having a bit of trouble getting through in the broader indices rather than the NASDAQ, um, they've got themselves into this, this tight ring um, of the last 10 days. If, if they take out the top end of the range, they're probably capable of going back to the old highs. But if they start to roll in here and take out the lows that we had in, within this last 10 days, this whole thing starts to look like it's a bit of the rolling top. So... Um, time for caution. You know, the very central banks are out there still putting money into the systems and, you know, saying that if it doesn't work, they will just fuel it up with more. But, uh, it, you know, for now, that's finding its movement into the equity markets rather than into the economy. So uh, we'll see how it unfolds. How much of a week was it for gold? Well, this is a pretty good week. You know, we're a bit of a pause 
end of the week here. Uh, the uh, We did manage to get up at intraday. Uh, you made a new high for the year. Uh, the nearby futures contracts got up $1,800 uh, on, uh, I guess it was Tuesday. Now, uh, we had, uh, back in 2011, when gold made its all-time high, uh, that run was uh, something that uh, had some pretty good characteristics to it that uh, helped us identify the August high. The we're, Here we are, um, just coming into the month of July, and historically, there's only uh, eight years where gold has managed to make a new 52-week high during July. And if we were to close uh, up through the 1800 level uh, in the next, well, in the next uh, week or two, this would um, fit into that category. The uh, And the action becomes significant uh, in that the, the move from the previous low, corrective low, and in this case, that's June the 5th. Uh, that's when we dropped off and had that uh, reasonably sharp drop down into the 1670th range. Uh, so measuring from there, the if you make a new high in July, that run from the low uh, historically becomes about 34 days plus or minus. So... The optimum target, uh, if this thing breaks out, uh, is going to be the last week of July. And we know that when gold and or silver like to run, the best part of that loop is in the tail end of it. So, you know, we've been pretty much consolidating in uh, the gold market uh, since the latter part of March. Uh, we were looking for it to have trouble breaking out within a three-month period because of the timing that it had had with the bottom in the oil market. And we're getting, you know, to the end of that three months window of consolidation. So if it decides to go, um, it's got a pretty good chance. And when we look at the size of the beast that, we, uh, that we've had from uh, 2015 uh, through uh, until it broke out around the 1550, 1560 range, that base, when we measure it up, We've been looking at the target as 1888. So I think if we start to get some momentum here, um, testing that 1888 level could very well be seen by the end of July. How is crude doing? Crude is um, just, you know, it's fairly tight range here. Uh, got its spell stuck between 37 and 40 and a half. Uh, not, not a lot of momentum in there right now. Still think that uh, it, uh, yeah, it it could ease its way back into the mid to low uh, 30s. The if we look at the uh, stocks like the XLE or the XEG in Canada, uh, they topped out a couple of weeks ago, uh, not showing too much uh, ability to hold the gains, and uh, still thinking that uh, those you know that's a, a sector for. For the nimble, you know, there's some short-term trades, but uh, I would rather be um, you know, aware of the fact that, you know, in in markets you want to be long the strong stocks and short the weak one. And when we take a look at energies, they're still in that weak sector. If they go back and test the lows that we had in March, April, it might be worth taking a look at them down there, but that's, you know, that's probably about down the road. Seeing as how we had Canada Day and uh, we have Independence Day, how are the Canadian and U.S. dollars doing? Well, uh, you know, it's, the Canadian managed to bounce a little bit here. Nothing big, big there. You know, it, I was looking at the dollar index, and, uh, you know, we've been, we're all, everybody gets excited about the short-term moves in currencies. You know, the, the U.S. dollar index, for the last Two years has been stuck in a four percent trading range. That's about as quiet as you can get in in any commodity or any stock. And in over ten years, uh, or sorry, over five years, we get a ten percent trading range. So you know, there's there's just not a lot happening when it comes to you know the dollar index. Um, the the Canadian dollar definitely has bigger swings than that. And uh, the latest little bounce in here really is still 
underperforming what we're seeing in the commodity sector. Now, we take a look at not just crude oil, which has sort of worked its way back up 40-ish. Uh, the uh, agricultural index, the DBA, has been basing out in here. Now, we recommended a long position in there, uh, thinking that it, it could do well in the coming months. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that bias that's showing up in there really is not being reflected across with the Canadian dollar. So still still of the mindset that um, the trend as far as Canada is concerned is for the downside. Ross, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. And we'll be back with you again next week, Jim. Thank you. My guest has been Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Eric Haddock, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrackTrading.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Eric. Oh, thanks for having me back, Jim. Eric, the markets right now, uh, we'd really like to know what's going on with gold. Where is that in all of the cycles you follow? Gold has really not, from, from a broader perspective, has not changed much uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, major cycles bottomed in, in late 2015, early 2016, and then uh, I was looking for a secondary low in the third quarter of 2018. Uh, in fact, there's a couple of publications that I that people are still requesting that I send out from 2018 that kind of described the the roadmap going forward from there, where I thought that gold and gold stocks would work progressively higher into late 2020, early 2021. So within that uh, outlook and that from that perspective, uh, they are gold and silver right on track. Uh, silver is certainly the weaker sister, but a lot of that has to do with what has been driving gold uh, through the majority of this um, this move up, and and many of the surges, uh, particularly in uh, March and April or February, March and April of this year, uh, those surges come on. Um, on, on the, the stock sell-offs and other unnerving uh, type of uh, events or news like the, obviously, the COVID pan- pandemic. And that's, that, they're the type of times where gold and silver diverge a bit because while money is, is flying into gold as a, as a, a safe haven status or a, uh, a hedge against um, uncertainty. Uh, at the same time, that uncertainty impacts the un- industrial aspect of silver. So silver often tends to lag. But what I have been saying throughout this year, especially since silver had a just this um, very intriguing and very impressive web of cycles that were arguing for a, a major bottom during the week of March 16th to the 20th, uh, my contention has been that from there into uh, the second quarter of next year, 2021, that you would probably see that relationship start to shift and that on balance that would be when the gold-silver ratio uh, starts to contract a bit. So the moves in silver would be proportionately greater than the moves in gold. And like I said, that's that's looking at it from an overall standpoint. There's still going to be times where uh where we get 
like we're having now, spikes in coronavirus, uh, particularly in the U.S., and, and so gold outpaces silver during those moves. But as, uh, as we see more and more signs of economic recovery and kind of inflationary um, type uh, signals on the horizon, that's when silver starts to uh, see a little better potential, relatively speaking. So that's what I think we're going to see uh, over the next six to nine months is um, the uptrend continuing, but silver uh, starting to take a little more, uh, a bigger role in that uh, remaining uptrend. Copper has bounced back. Is that a surprise or temporary? Uh, you know, copper is kind of right in between uh, what you're talking about. It certainly recovered along with, um, you know, so many things from stocks to energy markets to gold and silver all had um, major cycle bottoms and uh, critical support levels tested in mid-March. And, and and that was also, it wasn't that, that all of a sudden uh, the economy comes roaring back, although it certainly appears to have done so since then, but it's that's the, uh, that's the low of, of perception of, uh, you know, the outlook. And all those markets, as markets always do, had swung too far in one direction. And, and so, you know, the, the rally in copper has been somewhat of that reaction that, you know, from January to March, you saw it plummet from 290 down to about $2 in the, uh, December futures contract. And, and now it has slowly, steadily made its way back up to about 275. So really it's, it's close to where we ended last year. And, uh, and so, you know, some things have changed because of the global pandemic, but a lot of things have not changed. And so it's, it's copper kind of getting back to where it was, which was in a bottoming phase, uh, through 2019. And you had that final spike low into March of this year and now kind of getting back up to that. Uh, 250 to 280, 290 range where it has been, um, where it really traded for a majority of of the last 18 months. Is there any area that's really been distorted by all the money printing and propping up of the markets, or has have the cycles actually hit this anyway? Uh, the cycles have certainly hit a, a lot of it and, and some of that money printing just kind of exacerbated the, uh, the moves, um, and, and helped the reactions from, uh, cycle lows. I think that you often have, uh, slight distortion, which is, which is why I will, uh, always discuss cycles um, with the preferred scenario, but also a, a slight range of error to either side of a particular cycle low or high. Um, a, a narrow enough range of error that it still is practical to, to use for uh, trading, but um, giving a little leeway, knowing that there are plenty of distortions out there and the markets aren't perfect or, or my perception of the markets isn't perfect. I guess that's a better way of, uh, describing it. But I do think that, um, that it is going to have a, uh, significant impact on some of the cycles moving forward. And one of those, uh, does have to do with, uh, a bit of an inflationary scenario that uh, that I've been expecting from uh, second quarter 2020 into second quarter of 2021. So, and I and I think that we're going to see the U.S. dollar um, reflect some of that too. It peaked during a very consistent um, 38 to 41 month cycle. Uh, it has really adhered to that time frame about three and a quarter years 
uh, in duration, for 20, 30 years, uh, the dollar has seen almost all of its major uh, swing points uh, on that type of rhythm. And so the latest phase of that was in March of 2020, was the the, the most synergistic uh, convergence of cycles, when a um, another significant top was expected, and that came 38 months from the January 2017 peak uh, that that occurred right after the election. And so I think that the dollar is now uh, kind of going through that topping and reversing phase. And as we get farther along through this year and into next year, uh, we're going to see more selling in the dollar. And some of that uh, is probably a result of um, the mass stimulus that has been triggered in the early part of 2020. So I think it is going to play a role, but in most cases, it's a reinforcing or corroborating role to those cycles, not something that conflicts, because usually the markets are already picking up on things before certain fundamentals are announced or or come to light for the masses. Um, there's already driving forces that are uh, influencing that and that um, big investors are recognizing. So then when you get the uh, the more overt fundamental, uh, the market just um, accelerates from, from the turning points or in the trends that uh, already exist. We'll have more with Eric Haddock when This Week in Money returns. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Eric Haddock. Eric, what's going on with oil? I think that oil is in a similar recovery mode as so many of these other markets. Um, Obviously, the pendulum swung so far to the extreme with with crude oil in uh, March and early April. You know, when you have a a print or a quote of negative forty dollars in a in a contract, as you did with crude oil, uh, that that's gone about as far to one extreme as you can really envision. And so, I think that a lot of what we're seeing is recovery and reaction from that. I I do think that it's going to continue. Uh, in some of my publications I've been discussing where I thought that, um, crude could get up to, uh, the, about a 47 to $49 a barrel level. That's kind of a, uh, pivotal level for me, particularly in the, uh, December futures contract. Um, so I think there's the, the potential to, uh, surge up to there in the coming weeks. Uh, but really that would just, that would just take you back to where, uh, the real meltdown, uh, began. Uh, you know, in, in early January we were up at around $60 a barrel and it was after that January, February slide. Then, uh, you had a little rebound in early February back to about $48, $49 on this contract and then the meltdown, um, ensued and so the reason I mentioned that is just to kind of put it in perspective that uh, a rally back to there is really just um, returning to a three to four month equilibrium point but I do think that's going to be a a critical test for oil and whether whether this is just a couple months rebounding and reacting to to the meltdown seen earlier this year, or if it's the early stages of a 
a more sustainable uptrend. And and really, for me right now, the, the jury is out on that. What's going on with Bitcoin? Bitcoin has, um, I think it's been in recovery since, um, through, mo- through most of this year. But my outlook has been that on a 6 to 12 month basis, that Bitcoin would uh, slowly, steadily make its way higher into uh, the end of this year. But on a intermediate basis, it set its highest daily close on May 8th and has really just traded sideways for six, seven weeks since then. Um, it peaked right around the 10,000 uh, level, and I have been expecting to see a correction back to at least 8,200 and possibly spiking down 7,800. Um, you could even see an extreme spike to 7,500. Uh, as long as it holds that, I would kind of view that as a just a second wave pullback as part of what I expect would be a uh, six to nine month advance from March into um, the latter part of this year. That's when I'm looking for the next significant, and when I say significant, that would be at least three to six months, maybe six to 12 month peak in Bitcoin. Uh, right now, uh, on a on a one to two year basis, uh, ten thousand ten thousand five hundred is the first level of critical resistance, which we've just been up against. But fourteen thousand is um, kind of make or break resistance. Uh, so if we can hold this, if we only spike down to about eight thousand, eighty two hundred, maybe seventy eight hundred, and can hold that support. I could see a scenario where Bitcoin makes its way back up to to at least twelve thousand, maybe even spiking as high as fourteen towards the end of this year, uh, and and that too could easily go along with um, if you do see the dollar start to uh, run into a bit more trouble, and and some of that money flows both into hard assets, your gold and silver. Um, but also into digital uh, and cryptocurrency. Are interest rates going to stay low for as long as we can see in the near future? The actual rates, probably, but I think the perception is now at an extreme. Uh, I've talked about this for a couple years now, that uh, bonds, for instance, uh, which I'm sure most of your listeners know trade inversely to interest rates. So when you're talking about a peak in bonds, you're talking about a low in the governing interest rates. Uh, but the bond market, uh, has, has seen a very consistent four year cycle for 30 years. Uh, in fact, I even elaborated it more on it more in my, uh, July inside track, uh, that just went out recently. And that has continually told me to look for a major top in bonds and, and 10 year notes as well in mid 2020, ideally in June, July of 2020. And that is linked to similar peaks that were seen in right in the middle of 2016, right in the middle of 2012. Um, and I trace this cycle back, <clears throat> uh, excuse me into the um, 1990s and, and before. And so even as we came into um, lows in the third quarter of 2018, uh, that was that was my focus that we were uh, we needed to see an, a new one to two year uptrend into mid 2020. And and really the one of the keys uh, when I was talking about this perfect storm of sell signals in in the stock market in early February, Uh, one of the things that I was also referencing was that my analysis in bonds continued to say the same thing, uh, continued to say that we needed another uh, plunge in in interest rates and the perception of interest rates leading into mid-year, and and that bonds had already given that signal that they were going to rally into mid-year. Then we started getting all of these 
uh, corresponding cell signals in stocks and, and related vehicles. Uh, and, and so it all kind of fits together. But I do think that we are at that peak. And, and so I think that the perception is going to slowly shift. And it's kind of like what I was just talking about uh, earlier with regard to the mid-March low in stocks, in silver, uh, where you, you go to such an extreme. Um, and so then the market needs to come back to a little bit more of a point of equilibrium. So bonds topping and, and if they do start to gradually roll over to the downside and see some selling later on this year, doesn't necessarily mean the actual interest rates are going to make any big shift, uh, but it's just that the perception is starting to change. And if we do continue to see more economic recovery and if we do see some uh, in hints of inflation throughout the second half of this year and into early 2021, all those things also start to influence the perception of uh, of bonds and corresponding interest rates. So uh, I think the actual rates are going to stay very low for, for quite some time, but I think that the bond market is, is setting a peak and, and will progressively move away from that peak uh, to the downside, even if it's not an accelerated move to the downside. What cycle has really caught your eye recently and you're really watching? I'd say one of the uh one of the ones that uh has really been intriguing to me for the last uh, couple of months and it's funny because it's a little bit like that four year cycle I just described in in bonds but one of the most consistent and uh intriguing and uncanny cycles is in the grain markets and particularly soybeans and and this is one that uh, I've detailed and described going back to the early 1970s. And uh, the, the conclusion I reached was that we needed to see a uh, a big sharp rally in uh, June, July, potentially stretching into September of this year, and then set a uh, another peak because soybeans have set um, multi-year peaks on a four-year rhythm, and you can. It was interesting because really from 2000 into 2012, uh, soybeans were in a major bull market, and it was almost a textbook five wave Elliott wave sequence for any of your listeners that are familiar with Elliott wave but the the peaks within that move up uh were also adhering to this four year cycle you saw an initial high in the middle of 2000 then a little bit more significant high which was really the culmination of the first wave rally in mid 2004 then you pulled back for a year or so, then another rally into mid-2008. That was the high of the what would be considered the third wave of in an Elliott wave sequence. So another uh, drop from there, and then a final surge into mid-2012. Uh, then four years later, you saw a secondary peak in mid-2016, and all of that has been telling me to look for a similar uh, peak in July through September of 2020. But in many of those cases, um, the, the peak was the culmination of a two or three month surge. So it's not like, it's not like it's a two or three year steady uptrend leading into that peak. Instead, it's a lot of sideways trading. And then all of a sudden, you get some factor that uh, just creates this massive surge. And like, uh, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but the markets go to an extreme, go far beyond what they really should. And then you have this peak created that uh, that 
easily holds for a year or two and often much longer than that. So all of that has been on my radar looking for a, uh, a surge in soybeans in June and July and, like I said, probably seeing a, a second surge that could carry them higher into September. And and so I had some um, one- to three-month buy signals that were generated in early June and then in late June um, another set of more intermediate or shorter to intermediate-term buy signals uh, with some very specific upside targets. And then within days after those buy signals were triggered, we get uh, a combination of both um, acreage news, which is moderately favorable, and at the same time, there's more attention being paid to China and their agreement to sharply increase their purchases of soybeans as part of the phase one trade deal. So it's one of these things where uh, one of the fundamentals, the, the phase one trade deal, has been known since uh, January, but the markets were not ready to respond to that, and lo and behold, China wasn't buying much soybeans. Then you get these technical and, and cyclical signals triggered that uh, that project a, a sharp rally in late June and carrying on into July and, again, potentially stretching into September. And all of a sudden, uh, within weeks, uh, even within days, fundamental news comes out and, and starts to corroborate that. And so you get this this thinking now that, um, China's way behind on fulfilling their their agreement uh, as far as agricultural products, but uh, soybeans are one of the primary ones, soybeans and pork. And and so now they're starting to ramp up that those purchases. And so it's just again, I'm just kind of explaining how the the fundamentals uh, always or almost always pop up after the technicals and cycles have already indicated a move, have already given plenty of warning signals to get into a move, then usually the fundamentals kick in somewhere midway during that and reinforce what what the charts have already been showing. And so that's a, that's a pretty significant uh, cycle that I'm watching because I think there is, is still uh, significantly more upside potential, but... Uh, because of the surge we've already seen, there's uh, there certainly is a trading aspect to it where you don't want to just be um, buying with reckless abandon, but you want to time time those purchases right and and control your your risk as part of them. So that and and that really goes along with some other commodity and and inflationary cycles too. Um, so we could see a um, a continuing increase in uh, overall commodity prices uh, in the second half of this year, but again, that's coming from a major low in March as well. So it's it's all relative. Eric, before we go, can you tell us a bit about inside track trading? Inside track trading is a um, Cycle and technical based advisory service in in the markets. We cover um, financial and commodity markets, uh, which is kind of a broad spectrum, uh, dealing with most of the markets that people are concerned with, and providing different uh, level and different um, frequency of publications based on traders' needs and desires. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, educational and tutorial information available, and uh, and a lot of archived um, articles and reports that really explain a lot of the cycles and technicals that you and I talk about, as well as as quite a bit more. Eric, thank you so much for being on this week in money. Thanks for having me back, Jim. It's my pleasure. My guest has been Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrackTrading.com. Coming up, 
Victor Adair, next on This Week in Money. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Victor Adair, co-founder of the Polar Futures Group. Victor, you've just hung up your skates metaphorically in the brokerage business. So after how many billions of centuries? <laughs> well, uh, you're right, Jim. I just uh, At the end of June, I retired from uh, the brokerage industry. I had uh, most recently been a uh, senior vice president, derivatives portfolio manager with PI Financial. Uh, really enjoyed my time there. Wonderful people. My son continues to work there. And the uh, website that we have, polarfuturesgroup.com, which has uh, got the blogs that I've written for the past couple of years there, uh, that that's going to remain up for a while. But, uh, yeah, I'm uh, no longer in the business uh, as a broker. I will be just a, uh, you know, a retired old guy living on Vancouver Island, uh, trading the markets for my own account. And, um uh, uh, doing uh, interviews, and uh, I'll, by by next week or so, I should have my new website up, and uh, we'll be able to post blogs there. But uh, yeah, it's it's a change. Uh, there wasn't any particular reason to do it. I just sort of thought it was time, you know. And and like you say, that hang up your skates. Everybody in Canada knows what that means. Uh, I don't plan to stop working, uh, but you know, just work changes. So. Anyway, yes, uh, there is a change, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I guess in my career, I took what I called sabbaticals, and I got that term from my uncle, who was a university professor, where every seven years or so they would take a, a year off from teaching classes and, and all that sort of thing and go somewhere and maybe you know write a book or do some deep research or something and then you know come back to, to the business. And I've had a few sabbaticals uh, in my career, and uh, I'm thinking of this as another one where you just, you know, I'm still absolutely, totally interested in markets, want to participate, want to pay attention, but just from a little different point of view. So now you're uh, commenting from the sidelines and not really being in the game, but as we know, having watched sports all of our lives, that doesn't mean that you're not still involved in it in some way. Yeah, you know, realistically, I mean, uh, you're always on the sidelines uh, in in markets because they're just so huge. You know, no nobody is uh, nobody is a Wayne Gretzky really. You know, in the markets because it can, can can really have that kind of an impact. But uh, yeah, I think maybe you know one of the things I've been thinking about, and this has to do with time frame, and uh, I'm I'm. I'm I'm expecting maybe that well while I'm retired or in this period that I'm going to be changing my time frame a bit from being let's say you know two days to two weeks is how I was looking at markets. I feel and this is more intuitive than anything I could really give you evidence about, but my intuition I have to trust it over the years and it's 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 been pretty good. This virus thing, let's just call it that, coming at a time when it came. Uh, I think it is uh, has has made like a, a major change in in society, in in markets, in governments. You know, we're seeing all this social tension these days. Uh, I, I think there is a, a real, let's call it a turning point of some kind here. Uh, Neil Howe might refer to it as a fourth turning. I think there is something major shifting in markets. And uh, I, I'm very interested in that because all my career I've kind of thought that what a what a trader needs to do is to kind of look at markets as they are now, kind of imagine how they might be at some point in the future. In other words, you know how they might change, and then try to position yourself to benefit from that change. While at the same time, you know, when you take those positions, having a plan that you know if you're if your view of the future isn't working out, you know, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to limit your losses? How are you going to, you know, 
uh, let's say, unwind the positions you've got on. So, yeah, I, I'm very interested in how uh, some, uh, I think that maybe even it's a demographic change. You know, and that, those are sort of things that happen over, over decades. But we may be at a very interesting inflection point here, and that will certainly show up in markets. It just pops into my mind right now, Robert Prechter, who at one time in the early 80s could move markets. He was, he had a huge subscriber list to his, uh, Elliott Wave theory ideas. And I met with Bob one time and I was talking to him and he made a point that has stayed in my mind forever. And that is that the social mood, as he called it, moves the markets, not the other way around. And, uh, you know, I think oftentimes we get so caught up in the, the details of the market that we forget about this social mood having a, a big impact. So that will be one of the things I'm looking at. But anyway, <laughs> we, we, could, we should get, get down to the, the nuts and bolts of the interview here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, does not being a broker anymore change your time horizon on how you look at the markets and trades? Um, I think it might. It might, as I was just saying. I'm very interested in this, um, what I think may be a major change happening in the social mood and how that will impact markets, how I will actually, you know, take positions in the market with my own money. Uh, I'll see. You know, I've developed some habits over the years, and most of those habits are very much driven by being quick to get out of positions that aren't working. And that has saved my bacon, you know, so many times over the years. It may be that I, I will want to give markets a little more time. So that would just automatically mean I'd need to reduce my position size or whatever. So I, I don't want to suddenly start taking positions with a three month time horizon and take, you know, lose 20% of my trading capital or something because of one idea. So I'll have to adjust things, but yeah, I think I probably will have a, a little more of a longer-term time horizon than I had when uh, through most of my career. One of the biggest market puzzles lately has been the divergence between rising stock markets and the weak economy. What do you make of that, and can it continue? That has been a huge puzzle. Uh, obviously, some of the big stars in the in the world of, uh, of finance. Uh, whether you're talking Stanley Druckenmiller, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, a number of other people, uh, more than I could list off here, have been perplexed. I mean, Warren Buffett, you know, I mean, the people are talking about Warren Buffett now as though he's just become a babbling old idiot. You know, he doesn't matter anymore, uh, because he's, you know, missed the move, as it were. Uh, a lot of people have been puzzled by that. Um, clearly, we had a, a brutal, uh, sell off from all time highs, which we reached in uh, February for a, one month. You know, the market lost in excess of 30% on the broad indices. That's a pretty brutal sell off. And then the Federal Reserve, other central banks, the government stepped in with all of this stimulus, massive stimulus, like, you know, central planning in a capitalist society like we've never seen before, let's say outside of, you know, wartime. And, and maybe it was a war. And certainly on top of that, the, the existential um, fear that came with the, the pandemic, the virus. You know, I mean, were we all going to die from this thing? So we had an extraordinary point in time. Volatility was unbelievable. And then this rally from the March lows began. I have thought that uh, that would be a bear market rally, that the, the hit that the economy had taken – uh, was not going to be something we could recover from in a heartbeat, and sooner or later uh, that would have to impact uh, how much people were willing to pay for things in the stock market. Uh, so, yeah, the, 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 the puzzle has been the stock market has just gone whistling you know, past the graveyard, as it were, uh, rallying, uh, and I can't say that just as though it's a monolithic thing. I mean, the stock market has not been monolithic. We've had some extraordinary gains in a narrow sector of the market. Everybody can talk about the fangs and that sort of thing, and, and absolutely, there's been a handful or two of, uh, of the tech stocks. I mean, Amazon is right at the front because they're, you know, this massive retail organization. I, I saw the other day that Jeff Bezos' net worth is now somewhere as was it 170 billion here or something? <laughs> Huge. Uh, 
there has been a, a constant, the stock market has not been monolithic. It's been a handful of stocks that have really soared. The broad market is still below, you know, uh, the levels of a year ago. Once you, if you were to strip out the, the, the rising market, the, 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 uh, the, the handful of stocks that have pulled the market higher. Will it continue? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I have to be ambivalent. Uh, if I get stubborn with a point of view, uh, I, I can easily lose too much money. Uh, my my gut feeling is that the stock market rally off the March lows is running out of steam here. When I say here, I mean over the past month or so. It looks as though you know we're kind of chopping around. Now I'm talking about like the S&P 500, Nasdaq obviously has run away to the upside. I see the ratio between the Nasdaq and the S&P is now back to the extraordinary highs it hit during the dot com level. In other words. The ratio is at back to uh, uh, the highest levels it's been in 20 years. And the, the levels that it hit 20 years ago were the highs, and then we had a god-awful reversal in the NASDAQ relative to the rest of the market. Uh, it could continue. You know, um, th- these things can go on uh, and on and on. Relationships can go on and on and on, and then they, they change. Uh, I am at the moment... Uh, largely sitting on my hands as far as taking positions in the markets. Uh, I don't see anything that is, you know, screaming I, that I need to take a position. So uh, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll be neutral. When, when you're outside of the market looking in, maybe you're a little more ambivalent or a little more even-handed when it comes to, to making a decision. In recent weeks, you've pointed out in your blog that it's all one market. The different asset classes seem to be moving up and down relative to changes in risk on, risk off psychology. Why is that happening? Is it temporary and could it keep going? Yeah, what I, what I refer to as all one market, uh, for instance, here's how it looks. And this is a gross simplification, but, okay. I, I am, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very intrigued with this social mood idea. Uh, another fellow I have to mention is Jimmy Dines. I have a, an autographed copy of Jimmy Dines' book called Mass Psychology, and he talks about how, you know, mass psychology moves the market. Uh, I, I refer to it as market psychology. And certainly, uh, the, the, over time, the, the, the mass of people that are participating in the market will oscillate between being very aggressive, or what we call risk on, and then very pessimistic or risk off. You, that's when you, you know, you phone your broker, if anybody still phones a broker anymore, or you just, you know, in a panic, hit the sell button on your computer, get me out orders, you know. Uh, the, there is this oscillation constantly between how people are, you know, the herd, as it were. They're stampeding toward the edge of the cliff or they're stampeding, you know, the other way. Or a lot of times maybe they're just wandering around not stampeding anywhere. But the way it's been playing out is when the market is bullish, has this risk on psychology, I think the epicenter, as far as the world is concerned, is the E-mini S&P futures contract traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And that sort of everything else takes its cue from that. I used to talk about this back in the day when we had all the big trading floors, and I'd say there's a guy trading in the soya bean pit, you know, and he's aggressively trading soybeans, knows a lot about soybeans, but he also is looking over his shoulder all the time at the big boards up on the wall that are telling him what's going on in the currency market, what's going on in the crude oil market, you know, what the interest rate markets are doing, what the stock market's doing, because of this interrelatedness between markets. It's always there. Sometimes when, let's say, markets are not stampeding one way or the other, the soybeans are going to trade off of things that are really important to soybeans. At other times when markets are maybe stampeding one way or the other, the soybean market is going to be trading off of what is important to the stock market, more so than what's important to beans. That, that's what I mean by this all-one market idea. So lately... When the bullish mood is in place and the stock market is rallying, uh, the U.S. dollar is weak. Commodities are bid, in other words, particularly, let's say, crude oil. And when the market is risk off, you know, it's the opposite. Stock markets are going down, the U.S. dollar gets bid, and, and commodities are offered. So uh, 
the thing that I've always, always been really intrigued by what I call inter-market relationships. Like, I remember interviewing Jimmy Rogers years ago, and he said to me something like, you know, how can you trade wheat in Chicago if you don't know what's happening to the iron ore market in Beijing? Uh, well, th- doesn't that wrap it up? That's perfect. <laughs> I mean, how many things do you have to pay attention to? But you can learn about a market that you're trading by looking at how other markets affect it. So, you know, as I would say, that, that soybean guy in the pit looking over his shoulder at the board to see what's going on in all the other markets, he knows intuitively that you have to pay attention to those things. The, the tricky thing about intermarket relationships is that, like, once you kind of figure out the, I'm going to call it the if-then relationship, you know, if the stock market is rising, then, you know, the Canadian dollar will be going up. Well, it just seems to happen with those relationships that just when you kind of get them figured out that they stop working. So right now, um, that has been the case. I think if the market goes a little quieter in terms of, as I said earlier, stampeding around one way or the other, the re- the intermarket relationships kind of break down. Maybe the, the the more sophisticated way of saying this is the correlation between assets. You know, the distribution of that uh, will change. It can continue, and and then it'll stop. In your blog and previously on the show, you've talked about the stock market rally off the March lows as being a bear market rally. Do you still think that's what's going on? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, I do. Uh, and um, and I'm willing to be wrong on that. Uh, I have, I'd say, the last two months or so, uh, I have lost money. Uh, with my trading, uh, not very much because, as I said earlier, when I'm wrong in a trade, I'm out very quickly. So, I mean, I've, I've probably got about a two, two and a half percent drawdown on my trading account, and I can definitely live with that. But the reason for that is, is because I have thought that this rally off the March lows was running out of steam, and I've been early at picking a top. And in my game, early is the same thing as being wrong. Okay. Now, then you have to define what time horizon you're on, and that 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 maybe takes a little more thinking. But usually, my time horizon is if I'm putting on a trade, uh, I I don't want that trade to be underwater quickly or in the next few days. And if it is, I just say, you know, I'm wrong on this. Don't get out. So that, I have thought that that was a bear market rally. I still think that way. But as I say, I'm sitting on the sideline here looking for maybe a confirmation of that in the charts, and then I'll probably re-enter positions that would benefit if, in fact, the, the stock market rolls over from here. We'll have more with Victor Adair when This Week in Money returns. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Victor Adair. Victor, gold has rallied Five hundred and thirty dollars, or about forty percent from last year's lows, we're now around eighteen hundred dollars U.S. an ounce, which is about an eight-year high. Are we going to go higher? What are your thoughts? Yeah, gold has been uh, an amazing market. Uh, I've traded it uh, both from the short side and the long side over the last year. Uh, you know, my, my intuition is that uh, I think I'm a little money ahead, but certainly not much. Uh, when you say it's up. $500 from last year's lows ago. Wow. <laughs> you know, like, how did I not see that coming? But, uh, that, that's the thing. You know, y- you don't. You don't see these things coming. And, uh, although some people, you know, claim they do, and, um, I'm always suspicious of, of that to some degree. I mean, you can have reasons why you think something should happen, and then you have to balance off, well, how much of that is already in the price. Gold has had a, a, a great run, you know. Um, I think the the old thinking used to be that gold was like the flip side of the U.S. dollar. If the U.S. dollar was weak, then gold would go up. And historically, there has been a, a strong correlation that way. 
certainly in the last year, and I'd say maybe more than that, probably uh, the stronger correlation has been between uh, real interest rates and gold. So the decline uh, in real interest rates, I mean, these days, uh, real interest rates, once you take, let's say, the, the coupon rate, the nominal rate, subtract out inflation, you get the real rate. These days, uh, the real rate on U.S. Treasury instruments is negative. So the opportunity cost, as it were, of uh, owning gold is, is is there isn't any. Uh, matter of fact, you know, if you if you park your money in in something like Treasuries and you have the negative interest rate, then it, it costs you money to be there. So gold has really benefited from the decline in uh, real rates, and uh, that's probably the most important thing. There, there's also certainly been uh, the big kick here coming in March when the Fed and everybody else stepped in with the stimulus. Uh, if there's zillions of more dollars going around and there's not zillions of new ounces of gold, then you know an ounce of gold should be worth more money and certainly we've seen a change there. The price of gold uh, up, you know, three three hundred dollars and more, I guess, from the March lows. Uh, but here we are now. Uh, it's eighteen hundred dollars. We're at an eighteen. Uh, pardon me, an eight-year high. Are you a buyer or a seller of gold here? Certainly depends on your time frame and I guess your tolerance for pain. Uh, if if you're wrong on your timing, the past two months, what I have observed is gold was locked in a one hundred dollar trading range between the high and the low, and it and it viciously chopped around within that range. So it was, uh, you know, very easy to take a bullish position in gold, say, and have the market be fifty dollars against you two days later. And uh, in, in my trading framework, that that was that that's tough. I, I don't like that. So I haven't done much with gold here. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, I'm certain I haven't been a seller of it. But here at eighteen hundred dollars, what I do notice is that in the uh, ETF market. Going around the world, there's these different ETFs, and the major ones are in the United States. But in aggregate, uh, people have been got buying ETF, gold ETFs, with with both fists uh, the past several months. Maybe it stands to reason. You know, people uh, are, have seen the, the 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 fear in the market, and gold is kind of a go-to thing when that happens. Uh, the prices have been going up, and I think there's also this idea that uh, inflation is inevitable with the money printing that's been going on and classically you know that gold has been a great uh, hedge against that kind of uh, inflation or currency debasement so uh, i again i have no position on gold one way or the other right here I, I, it feels you know this is just my old ornery uh, sense of things that it's uh, a little ahead of itself here at eighteen hundred dollars but uh, I also understand that um, that it's been a bull market. It's up five hundred dollars in the last year, so I'd be very careful about fading it. Uh, I think at some point, you know, we can see gold go a lot higher. But to me, that's sort of useless information because, you know, if I buy it thinking that and it drops two hundred dollars right now, then I find myself in a quandary. You know, I'm two hundred dollars offside, and, and now what do you do? So at the moment, I have no position. I'll I'll just look at the charts and uh, trade it like I might trade any other market. In a two-week period in March of this year, the U.S. dollar index traded both above and below last year's highs and lows. In the last couple of months, the U.S. dollar's been softer. Are you bullish or bearish on the U.S. buck right now? Um, you know, uh, again, I'm kind of I'm neutral, uh, in, or I'm agnostic maybe is a better position like i'd be willing to be a buyer or a seller uh, whichever way the the market's going to go i don't want to get uh i don't want to say you know i'm I'm a hardcore bullish u.s dollar or hardcore bearish a lot we just talked about gold you know a lot of the people that are bullish gold sort of automatically are bearish the u.s dollar well that's gold against the u.s dollar Uh, typically if i'm trading currencies it's the U.S. dollar compared to other currencies. And if you're a gold guy, you say, well, the U.S. dollar is just like toilet paper, you know. Well, then, you know, 
all the other currencies are just like toilet paper. So once we got that off the map, you know, off the, off the table, I should say, then you're saying, is the U.S. dollar going to go up or down against the euro or the or the yen or the Russian ruble or the Brazilian real or the Canadian dollar or whatever? And in, and in that way of looking at things, uh, I'm not so not as negative, say, as as a as a gold bug would be about the U.S. dollar. I think the U.S. dollar relative to other currencies is is going to be. Um, uh, I could see in the short term, which is where I mostly trade. That if the market gets, as I was saying, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think that the bear market rally in, in stocks is running out of steam here. If the stock market starts to fall back a little bit, I think the U.S. dollar will get bid against most of the currencies that I pay attention to. The exception there might be the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc, which are sort of seen as relative safe havens. Uh, so... When I'm looking at currencies, it's not just the U.S. dollar. It's the U.S. dollar against different currencies. And then, of course, there's different currencies against each other. I mean, for instance, uh, in this past few months, as the stock markets have rallied, the Australian dollar has soared relative to the Canadian dollar. If I thought that the risk-on bias in the market was going to peter out some, I might be a seller of U.S. doll, uh, of pardon me, Australian dollars, and a buyer of Canadian dollars. Doing that spread, you know, that's more the way I trade, rather than just saying I'm, I'm bullish or bearish on the U.S. dollar. WTI crude dropped to negative forty dollars a barrel for one day in April. It's rallied back to trade around forty bucks a barrel the last few weeks. What are your thoughts on crude? You know, I, I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record here, but it just uh, the way I see things. Uh, crude, I think, has been pulled higher along with the stock market here the past couple of months. Uh, I think some of the fundamentals for crude, and let's get really basic, supply and demand, uh, are not bullish. Uh, and that maybe has more uh, a function of weak demand rather than uh, looking at the supply side. I know when we've done these interviews in the past, I, I keep harping on this, that uh, sort of the media, or at least mainstream media, will look much more at you know the supply side on the crude oil market. You know, are the OPEC and friends, you know, going to, to try to reduce, have an agreement to reduce production, and then are they going to keep that agreement, are they going to cheat on it, you know, and so on whereas the focus has not been so much on the demand side. And I think that's that's really the issue here. I mean, and it's also the issue, I guess, with my, I think it's a bear market rally in stocks, is the demand side. Uh, we have had uh, a credit-fueled demand in the world for the economy, and I, I think maybe that took us to a more uh, uh, ebullient place than we would have been without all that credit. Sort of obviously, but the the prospect here of the economy making a V-shaped recovery, and we're just back to where we were, folks. No big deal with the virus. Uh, we're going to carry on from here. I just don't believe it. I think the uh, the demand is going to struggle to to get back anywhere near where it was, and that the people that are producing crude uh, will try to keep cranking the stuff out because they need the cash flow, and uh, that will put pressure on the market but in the meantime yeah we've gone from call it 20 bucks i mean we had that the, the front month contract traded to minus 40 but basically the market hit a low of around 20 and so now we we doubled from there we're around 40 bucks on the nearby crude oil market and i think uh, that 20 dollar rally that doubling in price has been uh, an extension of the same risk-on attitude that has uh, pulled the stock market higher. So if that risk-on attitude runs into uh, difficulty, you know, to start to look at, say, the American economy having these semi-shutdowns as a, as the virus ramps up for one thing, or we just find that, yeah, we, we've had a, a, call it almost a 5 million jump, that was the number in the employment rate in the United States, the numbers that were released yesterday. But gee whiz, Harry, you know, we're still 15 million jobs short of where we were uh, in January. So, you know, is this really a V-shaped thing or is, like I'm saying, 
there's been something big happen here. We've had a big inflection point in markets. And uh, you know, to, to try to really get my mind around it, I'm afraid it, it boggled my mind. But short and <laughs> to, to kind of get short and sweet, uh, I, I'd be probably more likely to be a seller of crude at $40 than a buyer on the time frame that I trade in. Uh, that's relatively short time frame. And, and I don't have a position. It, I'll need to see evidence that the time has come to, to take that trade. One of the things that's happened during the lockdown is the explosion of new online retail traders. I guess the guys didn't have any sports to bet on, so now it's the stock market. You've been trading for 50 years. Before we wrap up today, any advice for these newbies on how to make money? Yeah, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit uh, last time. I see, for instance, uh, Robin Hood uh, has about 13 million traders, and that's an increase of... Three million uh, since, call it the, the beginning of the virus, and this is not just an American phenomena. I see it's also playing out uh, in different markets around the world. One place I, I saw was was Korea. There's been a, a massive increase in retail online trading in Korea. Um, you know the the. the the old dogs would say, you know, this is always what you would see uh, near a market top, uh, but that doesn't mean that this, you know, is the top, that when all the public comes piling in. And Bob Farrell uh, used to be with Merrill Lynch for years and years. One of his sayings was that uh, the public always buys the most at the top. Uh, but anyway, it, it, it's it's a phenomenon that's out there. Uh, in, in a way, you know, when you say I've been trading for 50 years, Fifty years ago, when I began trading, when I was a university student, so let's say I'm, you know, at that time the, the same age as the, the twenty-something-year-old kids now that are trading, I was started trading for the first time, and I was trading penny mining stocks on the Vancouver Stock Exchange, uh, just uh, you know, junk really. And how do you trade? You were trading on I knew nothing, uh, trading on tips and whatnot, and uh, had no idea what risk control meant. And uh, the, the difference was my my price information. You know, I would get the newspaper maybe in the morning, and see what had happened yesterday. <laughs> so <laughs> these days, at least, you know, you can stare at your, uh, your computer and see what's happening right at the moment. You no, know, whether or not that helps you, I, I don't know. I would say one of the things to keep in mind is uh, the, the classic old eighty twenty rule. And uh, this goes, uh, I've had a number of discussions with uh, other traders like myself over the years, you, uh, either reading about thing, about somebody and what they do, or I've had the opportunity to actually talk to some guys that have been enormously successful as traders. But a consistent thing is, it seems, that with get professional traders, that they make almost all of the money that they make from 20% of the trades that they make. The other 80% of the trades that they put on, they might as well not even have bought or put them on because they're either, you know, they kind of wash each other up. Uh, but you never know when you go to put a trade on if this one is going to be one of those 20% or if it's going to be one of the 80%. I mean, chances are, obviously, it's going to be one of the 80% because that's just the distribution on it. So the, the, that kind of brings about the question of what are you going to do when you're wrong and how do you know you're wrong? And if you don't know, where you're going to get out of a market before you get into a market, you're probably not going to be a successful trader in terms of net making money. And let me give you another example of the 80-20 rule. And this this was just a wonderful thing that uh, a friend of mine, Peter Brandt, uh, was pointing out recently. And that was that actually less than 20% of the time frames, he was looking at a career of about 40 years, that in less than 20% of those months, he actually made money. That the other 80% of the months, he either made no money or lost money. And that kind of goes to the, of the, the, the concept of how quickly were you expecting to make money? I mean, or regularly, did you figure you were going to make money like every day, every week, every month, you know? How about even every year? And that's just not going to happen. You know, the the real simple way of getting your mind around this is to understand. You know, to, I mean, don't just pay it lip service, but truly understand that any success that you have in trading 
comes uh, like as a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So it's over time. And you're going to have periods of time when, honestly, you can't find your ass with both hands. You're going to think to yourself, well, you know, I, I have no idea what I'm doing, and you probably don't. So now you now you got to dig down and see whether or not you really want to do this or not. And it's tough. Uh, consistently making money, not even say consistent, that, that I think even that the best guys in the world don't consistently make money. Uh, that's not true. I guess some of the people that are, you know, like having a return of 5 to 7%, which is maybe the kind of benchmark that pension funds look at, uh, but, you know, you know, maybe, maybe they can meet their benchmarks. But for the young folks that are trading online, I mean, they're not interested in making five or seven percent a year. You know, they want to make that a day. And, um, to, to do that, you're going to maybe be more aggressive than you should be. But you're going to, if the successful traders also find a way to participate in the market that suits them. Suits their temperament, suits their level of aggression or, or passivity, and uh, the, that that takes some trial and error. It's going to take a while, and you may find that you know I, I, what'll happen. You know, really, what'll happen is a lot of the folks that have turned to doing this at some point will say, "Yeah, this isn't for me," you know, and they'll they'll go do something else. But uh, if you don't want to be one of them, then you will go through your. Um, There'd be some kind of a classic rites of passage where you really get tested as to whether or not this is something you want to continue with. You know, my son got into the business, and I really didn't want to see him get into the business of the brokerage business because I'd seen a lot of guys just chewed up by the markets, and uh, that happens. If you if you want to avoid getting chewed up, then you know you really have to maybe put a little sticky on your computer screen and it says what am i going to do when i'm wrong and uh, you need to have an answer for that victor thank you so much for being on this week in money jimmy it's always good to talk to you uh, i look forward to doing uh, more of it in the future as i say um uh, i'll probably uh, people can still go to my old website at pi financial it's called uh, polarfuturesgroup.com there's nothing new being posted there they can see that some of the previous posts i put up and uh, I'll probably get a, a new website put together here in the next uh, week or two and uh, from time to time put up some of my, my ideas, what I think about markets and what I'm doing. My guest has been Victor Adair, co-founder of the Polar Futures Group. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Eric Haddock, and Victor Adair. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for our guests or the show, you can send them to info at housestreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Larry, you had a news release this week. What was in it? Well, it was a uh, quote by uh, Secretary Boulay uh, from the DOE, that, uh, and they mentioned American manganese in there as uh, a potential recycler of their material. And uh, we thought that was uh, great. We've come to the government's attention in a lot of cases. We've... Uh, came to some senators and some congressmen uh, that are following what we're doing. So uh, we're getting the word out there, Jim, and uh, it's nice to be mentioned in that article, uh, which tells you that uh, our transparency policy is working out because we've been very transparent. Everybody knows exactly what we get, exactly what we do, and uh, nobody else does that. And if they don't do that, I'm not understanding why, but I can guess. But the uh, point is that uh, 
you know, we're getting attention in the right circles. We'd like to get uh, more into the financial area, more attention in that area, although we've had lots of solicitations, but the, uh, you know, it's not, doesn't fit our pistol. And, uh, but we're moving on and, uh, it's, it's an excellent time for American manganese. I mean, this, uh, virus has, uh, certainly destroyed a lot of companies and a lot of people. And, uh, you know, but it's done good things for us. It's, uh, pointed up weaknesses, uh, specifically in governments that uh, have to be covered off. And, the, uh, and I say the short term, which uh, could be the next two or three years, because, uh, you know, now they see their vulnerability. And uh, so that's good for us moving ahead. Now, when I look at the uh, recycling arena, there's uh, very few companies out there that trade on the exchange that... Uh, that are really into the type of uh, recycling that we're recycling that we're doing. So we're really breaking a trail, and uh, breaking a trail is not easy. It's uh, tedious, steady work. Uh, for example, uh, my podcasts, and uh, every week I have to go through literally hundreds of uh, of emails that I get looking for nuggets and. Uh, so I can't do that because uh, I've got when I'm at work. There's uh, things that have to be done, and uh, so it usually ends up in the evenings and the weekends that uh, I dig out those nuggets. And uh, so uh, just to keep myself current, and not just uh, you know fo- totally focused on the uh, podcasts. I want to know what's happening in our industry. I want to know what's happening in the battery manufacturing, the EV manufacturing. I want to know what's happening with policies around the world. And uh, so it uh, it's uh, something that has to be done. And uh, you have to be current uh, because this is a new industry. You're not reading a lot about recycling except uh, the mention at the bottom of an article somewhere. But, uh, you know, that is going to change. I mean, you can't... Uh, keep building uh, mega factories and uh, benchmark has come up with some numbers that uh, basically has uh, some of those uh, statistics. Now, <clears throat> for example, China. China has uh, 107 uh, mega fa- uh, gigafactories in, in production, half are in production, half are being built. The U.S. has nine Europe has six, and uh, the other 11% is around the world. So what's that tell you? Well, China dominates the uh, entire battery manufacturing scene when it comes to EV cars and uh, lithium-ion batteries. So uh, that's not unusual. This has been their policy for, well, ever since I've been dealing with uh, with critical metals, uh, starting with manganese. They basically cornered the market on electrolytic manganese metal. They had hundreds of factories across China till they drove the price into the ground, and now uh, some of those factories are naturally shut. And uh, But there are some that are get, getting back up to uh, production quotas, but they're taking a lot less money. So uh, we... You've got to be careful about uh, Chinese dominance. Uh, it's not only uh, makes them a dominant player and the uh, key player, and, and there's no swing players out there. So uh, we we're hoping that uh, this uh, EV car battery manufacturing doesn't uh, dilute the market to the extent that uh, that some of the European and uh, and American uh, factories have to stop production or basically uh, go into bankruptcy because uh, prices will drop. Now, I think that's short-term. Prices will drop, but uh, it's a short-term thing. Our recycling gets back uh, close to 100% of these valuable materials, and, uh, we, and we've got enough batteries in the stream right now. There's, I think, like 3 million EV cars out there, but that have been uh, built in the last few years, 
and uh, some of them are reaching the end of life today, and they'll be reaching the end of life each, each year as we go forward. And uh, that's certainly our market, the one we're looking at, and we want to keep our costs down, although we're finding that, uh, you know, you have to take in partnerships and everything else where you have to uh, split the pie up. And uh, But we still want to end up with a robust amount for the efforts that we put in. So uh, the other thing that's happening out there is Japan is now talking about stockpiling 31 critical metals, and uh, they're going to not disclose how much they've stockpiled, and I don't blame them for that because, uh, you know, that also shows their availability. So, uh, but they are going to start stockpiling, which will help the uh, price of the uh, critical metals going forward. And uh, the U.S. used to have large stockpiles. I think they had a couple of million tons of uh, manganese at one point. They're down to about uh, less than 400,000 tons now of very low-grade manganese and uh, stockpiles. So, uh, you know, that's something that you'll see governments starting to do because... Uh, you know, if you don't have it in the country, or if you don't have a mine which takes years to develop and to uh, permit and finally put into production, then uh, you're going to need an immediate supply. So stockpiling is the answer. So I think you're going to see more governments start to stockpile these critical metals, and that's going to help the price uh, because it's going to take uh, material off the market that's needed today to build these batteries. So everything is looking very positive for the company, and uh, you know we're starting to, uh, certainly starting to see a little action in our stock. At last I looked, it was around twenty cents, and uh, so we've moved up from the uh, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen cent range and uh, gained back, uh, you know, from the bottom of our market. Uh, we've gained back uh, uh, the price that we had beginning uh, at the beginning of the market, and. Uh, now, when I'm talking about the market, I'm talking about the market that was affected by the coronavirus. So, all in all, Jim, I think uh, we've got a very good format going forward. And uh, the company is, uh, you know, very optimistic about what's happening. Uh, everybody in here is certainly uh, uh, thrilled about the results that we're getting. And uh, we're just waiting for the pilot plant to start up again. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be looking at somewhere between three to 600 ton a day plant rather than uh, the uh, or three to six ton a day plant rather than uh, just a three, day, three ton a day plant. Because our optimization is showing us that uh, for a little bit more money, uh, we can uh, perhaps double the production, and uh, that will increase the payback, and you know it's uh, and it will reduce the uh, operating costs. So that's a good thing, Jim. So uh, it is a long weekend. The U.S. is closed today, and uh, yesterday we had a good day in the U.S. over a million shares. We had uh, 1.75 million in the in uh, the uh, Canadian market under the uh, TSX Venture Exchange. So uh, those, that was a good day yesterday. Today we're down, I think it was around 250000 the last I looked, and 19 and a half to uh, 20. So uh, we're holding our own, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's stellar times. I think people are going to start to see some uh, changes in uh Hopefully, uh, the interest uh, by investors for uh, recycling is starting to pick up. Larry, where are you traded, and how can people get more information about American manganese? We're traded on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY. We're traded in the U.S. under the symbol AMYZF. We're traded uh, in the Frankfurt market under the symbol 2AM. If you really want to do due diligence on the company, go to our site, AmericanManganeseInc.com. You can always uh, phone the company at 778-574-4444, or 
or just send me an email at l-r-e-a-u-g-h at a-m-y-m-n dot com. Larry, thank you so much for the update. Thanks, Jim. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on July 3rd. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.